Hello and welcome back to Soteriology 101. As you can see, we have Pastor Ronnie Rogers, uh, our neighbors uh, to the north up there in Oklahoma. Uh, he's here joining me again today to talk about his newest book, uh, which is called, um, i put it up here up on the screen for you, If Only You Would Ask, Praying God's Conditional Promises. And so that is going to be the subject of our discussion today. Uh, Pastor Ronnie, thanks for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. Well, I, I want to talk about kind of what led you to write this book. I want to talk about, you know, some of the content of the book, maybe some pushback that you might get from those who disagree with us soteriologically. But before we jump into that, I do want to remind our listeners to subscribe and like the podcast. That helps so much. And I want to especially thank our patrons, those who give on a regular basis to help make this possible. Uh, this is a listener supported ministry, and we appreciate those who support the ministry. So, Pastor Ronnie, what, what is it that kind of led you to, to write this book in specific? A, a couple of things. One is, uh, and, and I wasn't even thinking about even writing or preaching a, a prayer series, but I was studying uh, foreknowledge and coordination and free will, compatibilism, and I did that for a few years. And, but I kept running across little pieces that I thought were relevant to uh, problematic areas in prayer. So I kept notes of those and wrote another book. Uh, and subsequent to that, I looked into this a little deeper and I began to realize that I had seen for many, many years and I had experienced it. So how, how do you pray for a meeting you have on Monday and expect anything to be different since God has foreknown forever what would happen at that meeting? How can your right. prayer affect that? Uh, we, we pray often, we do it more than we think. We pray for something after the fact, meaning the child, we hear they've been in a wreck and we pray, God, I, I pray they're all right. Well, the wreck has happened and there's something called backward causation, which is impossible. But does that mean that our prayers after the fact, not knowing everything about it, cannot have an influence? And I think they can. And then many things are determined by god but nevertheless when you look at the scripture it is so clear in every context that there are things that are conditioned on our asking so we know salvation we talk about that most <clears throat> but the great promises of prayer if you ask if you ask you can be assured he's going to do this if you ask i'll give it now so uh, you have not because you ask not, and so forth and so on. Well, we, we have two strands. One of them is the Calvinism, and if you read them, and I think even non-Calvinists have been overly influenced by their thoughts, and that is we give a caveat. Well, anything doesn't mean anything, and I agree with that. But then what does it mean? I mean, anything is a broad word, no matter how you say it, and then it's, repeated over and over and it's really in crucial times and so and, and I give this in the book uh, how they show it doesn't mean anything I agree but what does it mean can somebody tell me what it means and so I began probing that based on the context and come to find out and let me just say this the other side of this is we have the name it and claim it so we're afraid to go there and rightly so but it still does mean something. And so I, I began probing what that meant. And then like you have the promise, if you, if you ask and believe as though you have received it, which this is a big name it and claim it verse. But when you read it, it really means that. So what does that mean? And, and I began to wrestle with that. So what, what brought me to write the book was my own struggle through the years of thy will be done. Okay, why can't we just pray thy will be done? I mean, God's will is perfect. Why would you want to change that? Well, it appears to me based on the scripture that if we just had conditional promises, we would be happy. If we had just sovereignty and he was gonna do whatever he wanted to do, no matter what we prayed, or he was gonna somehow get us to pray what he's going to already do, we would ha be happy. It's having both of these. And that's what I began to wrestle with. How do they uh, intertwine? And I think they do. And I even think there are passages in the Bible 
that sometimes we call a passage uh, a free will passage and sometimes a determined, and that's true. But interestingly, some of the, the most fun verses are the ones that have that intertwined right in the passage, in the encounter of the people, there is God determining aspects of it and other aspects, they're clearly making choices. So my, I wanted to get bring all that together because I find those to be discouragements to serious praying about everything because somehow we're confusing these things and I understand and I was confused. And so now I've come to the place through the book and I reiterate this, that some things, since some things are determined and God, God has so constituted some things to be conditional if we ask. So if we ask, he'll do it. And the implication is if we don't ask, he will not do it. If any man lacks wisdom, let him ask. Well, if he's going to do it anyway, it's kind of a charade. So it appears to me if we ask, he'll give it. And if we don't, he won't. And so there are some things that will be different when we pray than when we do not pray. Now, when I pray and, and I, I don't know if it's a determined thing, that won't change, but it may be a conditional thing. So some of them I know from the Bible, but I'm talking about in his subjective will for me when I'm praying. And so thy will be done should be, you know, Lord, I trust you in the end, but you did say, make my requests known. And I just made them. And his will many times is to answer that. So mm -hmm. I, I say that, that some things will be different if you pray than if you do not pray. And some things are determined, but we don't know every one of those. And so my, where I am now in my own life and what I encourage people based on the book, what I show in the book, if I think about it, pray about it. Because, you know, how do you pray all the time? How do you pray unceasing? How do you pray about mm -hmm. everything? And so... That's what I'm trying to live. If I think about it, I pray about it. And I'm trying to disabuse myself of using the word hope. I'm, un I'm unsuccessful. I'm not 100% there yet. I just did it yesterday. Well, I hope you right. get better. Because he never promises to answer our hope. He promises to answer our request to him. So yep. I, after yep. I did that yesterday and I said this hope, then... I went away and I said, God, I don't hope this happens with them. I pray to you that it does. So it's it's revolutionary in that sense. Uh, in Sue and the side uh, comment, you know, talks about how sometimes Calvinists say prayer is not necessary for asking. In other words, prayer is not really going to change anything, but it's it's needed for our own worship or to. I, I've heard it said, it's to, it's really prayer is to align our will with the divine sovereign will. Um, and I even used to use that uh, in my own teaching when I was a Calvinist. I, I would tell people that prayer is not about changing what God's going to do or influencing God or in anything anything like that, because God doesn't change. His sovereign will doesn't change. It is it is faded, so to speak. I would never use that term because of the, its negative implications. But ultimately, that's what I was saying. And I would say, you know, we pray to align our will with God's sovereign decree. Uh, and so it's, it's necessary, we should do it, but for different reasons than what the Bible seems to indicate that we, we should do it. How, how do you reply to those kinds of statements from Calvinists who say, well, we really should pray. Uh, it's, praying is really about worship and aligning our will with his sovereign decree. And they do that. And there's basically three things that are said for the purpose of prayer. One of them is that it's more to change us than, you know, change God to do something the other is it is for fellowship and so it's not about requests being uh, answered or anything and then the other is about getting our prayers answered and, and changing outcomes <clears throat> and i think it's a little of all three but the problem with the calvinist viewpoint is again they'll tell you what it doesn't mean but but tell me what it means when he says if you ask anything, I'll do it so that your joy may be made complete. And if you look at the context of some of those in the Gospels, uh, Jesus, one of them, Jesus had just cleansed the temple, you know, the turning over. And the temple was the hub of Jewish life. And so this was very disconcerting to them. And then if you put the time when 
they had a traitor among them. Peter was, uh, had denied Christ. Jesus said he was leaving. He was going to die. I mean, we, we, it's hard for us to capture how disconcerted they were. And they actually went away and hid after uh, the crucifixion because he wasn't like following Plato or, or some philosopher where you could keep doing his teachings. If Christ didn't live, his teachings were irrelevant. Mm -hmm. And so they, they fell apart. Well, at one of those key moments, he said, you have asked me, but from now on you will ask the Father, and he will do what you ask if you ask. And so the temple would be gone, the whole hub of life, everything they knew, and Jesus was reorienting them. You've asked me, but I won't be here anymore. But if you ask the Father, I'll promise you this, he will do it. And if it's to move this mountain, he'll move it. Now, so I think the Calvinists have a huge problem with negating all the conditional promises. You know, he says, he says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And the verse before that, he says, if you ask, I will do it. It's the same grammatical construction. And so he's making promises that are conditional. And, I, and when you make a conditional promise, non-conditional, you've turned it into theatrics and nonsense. So I would answer right. that they have too many verses. Now, we're not even talking about salvation. We're talking about everything else that God has said, if you will, I will. Right. And the only implication you can draw from that is, if you don't, I will not. Because it, it, it's nonsensical for him to say, you need to ask and I'll do it, if he's going to do it anyway. Right. So all of the conditions, or if he's not going to do it, even if you do ask, yeah. <laughs> it's already set. Yeah, yeah. it doesn't make. Yeah. And and if he's got one commentator, and I quote him in one of the passages in the Gospels, and he said it. You know, I'm paraphrasing, but it's about he promises to do what we do when we do exactly what Christ said to do. I mean, that just turns it inside out. So I think just like uh, receive it as believing that you have received it. Now, I know that gets distorted, but I'm practicing that. And I, it's a very problematic thing for me because of my personality and my background, but I am practicing it. And I've learned one thing what that means over the years. I think there are other things, I just haven't learned them yet, but it's a very difficult thing to do and yet leave things knowing some things are determined and so I think they go to the extreme of just uh, eliminating any of the promises with God. And, you know, we're to pray unceasing. We're to pray about everything. And, and let me, and I don't, I, I'll stop here, but, you know. Um, so you have to ask yourself this question. And I've asked myself. Paul asked the Ephesians in chapter 6. Basically, pray that I'll have utterance, you know, for the spreading of the gospel. So here's the question, was that theatrics? Or if they prayed, it would affect the outcome, meaning it would make the gospel spread more, Paul would be more capable. Or was it just for show? And I, I, I believe it was real. So yeah. Jesus said, uh, Satan wants to sift you. And he said, but I pray for you. So the real question is, did Jesus' prayer matter? He seems like it mattered. He acted like it mattered. And I'm going to take it that it did matter, meaning if he wouldn't have prayed, the outcome would have been different. You say, what would it have been? I don't know because I'm not God. But his prayer did affect, and I can go through passage after passage, and you ask yourself, okay, did that matter? And if it didn't matter, let's quit playing charades because that's all it is. Yeah, that's very well put. Urel asked a good question here in the side chat. How would you respond to this question, Pastor Rogers? Does God change his mind or can he change his mind? I make this question based upon Jeremiah 26, 17 through 19. Well, I, here, here's what I believe, and I do write quite a bit in different places. 
that the nature of God is that he is essentially omniscient. So he has always known everything. And therefore, he does not have to actually change his mind about anything. And you say, well, what if, what if it says something like what you're quoting, or what if we pray and we ask something, would he change knowing that we had done that? No, he always knew you would do that. So he's essentially omniscient, just like he is essentially omnipresent. He's essentially omnipotent. He's essentially holy. He's essentially love. So he, and I, I know I'm going to mess up the English teachers, but he cannot not know something. So God has always known and that's where you get into this praying after the fact. And I, I, I devote a chapter to try to explain how this is not backward causation, where I, I pray after the fact. So the, the guy goes to the doctor, and my husband or wife goes to the doctor, and they say, I think you have cancer. You need to have these tests. And so I pray, and ends up they don't have cancer. Well, wait a minute, they were told they had cancer, but it is that God could have said to himself, I, if Ronnie prays, I will answer that, even if it's after the fact, and God always knew I would pray. So God made the difference, knowing that I would even pray after the fact, because he knows all things. So I don't think he has to change his mind. I think some of those things are said <clears throat> because it wouldn't make sense if no one was there except God. Mm -hmm. And he speaks in ways that we can understand. So he always blesses holiness, loving him, and he always judges sin. It's just the stating of that in that moment. So, you know, I believe in the meeting that I'm gonna have say Monday, next Monday, and I start praying about it on Sunday and I see God working in that meeting. I do believe if that was a conditional, now I don't always know that, see, it's particularly in the subjective area. If it was determined, then my prayers had no uh, bearing on it. But if it was a conditional and God worked and answered that prayer, he knew I would pray in eternity past and he chose to respond to that then. So he's not learning. He doesn't learn perceptively. He's not being informed as we go along. Yeah, well, well said. I, I was wondering if your, uh, your book, uh, and I have not read it yet, uh, I plan to, and I appreciate what you're doing. I always, always enjoy your books. You, you do a very good job uh, writing very uh, intently on these particular subjects that I'm interested in. So. Uh, the parable of the persistent widow out of Luke 18, for example, where there's the unjust judge in a sense that she's ultimately coming <laughs> to him over and over and over again, yeah. grant me justice against my adversary. And, and, and this is used as a parable to, seems to, to teach us to persist in asking because God is, is, is much greater than this unjust judge. And I was just wondering if that played in to your own studies with regard to this book as well. Yeah, it does. And, and, uh, and, I, and, and because you have, I think in Luke 11, you had the friend that kept hammering, you know, to get some bread. And, and so again, this book is about prayer. And I mentioned these other things. So a person can learn how Calvinism does not fit the scripture without reading one of the more theological books. This is a book about prayer. And I just asked, does it look like this situation was determined or not? You have to decide. So people can read. There's passage after passage I explore. Now, on that particular thing, you know, I have to take all of the passages. I have to take some things are determined, and they're not affected by anything we do. And, for example, Christ being born at the time and so forth. And yet, in that very context, in Matthew 1, 19 and 20, you find Joseph deliberating and making a choice, and he changed in that. So there again is, is something predetermined and, and some pre-choice. So you have to have that. You have to have these uh, conditionals, but then you have these two passages 
which are clearly about persisting, not giving up in prayer. I don't know every time, sometimes, you, you, so you have uh, ask, believing as though you have received it. So I prayed for God to provide the money for me to go on a mission trip. I haven't received it, but I have to not worry about it. That would be the minimal thing. Don't worry about it. But on the persisting, we all experience walking with God that he keeps something on our heart and he keeps bringing it back. And I, I take that if I'm walking with the spirit of God, that I'm supposed to keep bringing that before him. I'll be driving on the road and haven't thought about it. And all of a sudden that pops into my mind. I don't disregard it. I say, Lord, I bring this to you again and, you know, lay it before you. So <clears throat> some of it is teaching us to trust him in persisting and being obedient. And some of it is teaching us to trust him when we've asked and, and it seems over to go on. And, and I don't know every one of those. Mm -hmm. Can I share one experience I had sure. and that's very uh, not characteristic of me? So I know most of the people out there, or maybe none of them know me, but the people who know me would say I'm not a Liberty gibbet and I don't just have, uh, you know, sensationalism. But when I was writing this book in this very chapter about believing as though you have received it, and I was dealing with the text and all of that and trying to come to grips with what that means. My wife and I were in Oxford. We went to the coffee shop. This chapter is in the book. Uh, and, it, and it kind of embarrassed me to have to put it in there. But I felt like God wanted me to because I'm writing a book on trusting God and all of this. And, and so we go, we drink our coffee at Cafe Nero. We do it every day when we're over there. And I would put my glasses and jacket on the table to save the table while we got our coffee. We came back. We drank our coffee, we got ready to leave, and my sunglasses were gone. So we looked everywhere, and we asked the barista whom we know. I got down on my hands and knees under the table. I mean, it couldn't have stuck to the gum under the table, because I checked that too. It was nowhere to be found. And they were prescription glasses, and I, I would be stuck over there, you know, for another few weeks without them. And so finally, we, we just left. And I was so certain that I had missed them that I actually walked about 200 feet. And I told Gina, I said, I have to go back and look again. So I went back and scoured the place again. I mean, the whole room, not just where we sat. They weren't there. We left. So I, I was working on this book and I was working on believing as though you've received it. And what I learned was I said, OK, God, none of this makes sense to me, but I'm not going to worry about this. And, and I even asked the barista, why would they take my prescription sunglasses? Because they're not going to be able to use them. He said, they don't care about the lenses. They just want the frames. So I went that whole day fighting in my spirit. God, I'm not going to worry about it. You're going to take care of it. You know, your will be done. In the scheme of things, this is a very small thing, et cetera, et cetera. And so the next day, get up. I'm still working on the prayer book. On that chapter, we go back to drink our coffee at Cafe Nero. I sit down at the table. Gina's getting the coffee, and I'm saving the table. And I look, and she and the barista are laughing. And she said, motion me to come here. And I didn't want to get up. I thought I'd lose our table. And she said, they found your glasses. And so I got up, and I went over there. Now, you have to understand, I struggled for 24 hours about this prayer and just letting it go and like I had them. And I went up there and I said, you found my glasses? He said, yeah. And he handed them to me. And I said, so I get emotional thinking about it. I said, where, where did you find them? Because I looked everywhere. And he said, they were on the table where you were sitting. Now you can do with that what you want to. Hmm. I would say Gene and I, under Damocles sword, we will testify what I just told you. I don't know how they got back. I don't know where they went. I don't know what happened. I do know they were gone and then they were back. And he said he found them right where I left them. But I know one thing, 
that simple little thing that would not make much difference in the kingdom made a big difference in me and my wife. I think mm. he works like that. Yeah. Well, it's it's always interesting to me to to see how in the what are normally mundane happenstances like losing a pair of glasses. I usually find mine on the top of my head. That's usually where I've left them. Right. I've left my, my wife's like, they're right there, dear. Yeah. Um, or, or, you know, here in my pocket or something like that. I can't find them. But, um, but it's in those mundane happenstances that sometimes God speaks the loudest uh, and, and just telling us to trust him even, even with the little things of life yeah. and to trusting, trusting him as we go through our, our daily life. And that, that's part of the... I guess some of the philosophical differences uh, that differing views have, whether it's a more deterministic side, uh, you know, the, the more dynamic open theist side, um, and every view in between with all these different speculations as to how it works. And what all of these groups are striving to do, it sounds like to me, is, is to make logically things fit within how do we have a real interactive relationship with the God of the universe yeah. who is spiritual, a, not seen by the human eye. Um, he is all powerful, all knowing, um, a, a, a being that is, it relates to us very differently than every other person in our life. And, and therefore we're trying to s say, here's how we have interactions with him each day that are meaningful, yeah. that are, uh, that are real, that aren't just esoteric, um, you know, you know, fatalistic kinds of things. I, I remember struggling so much, especially in my earlier years, coming through Calvinism and everything else, with having a, a relationship with God because I saw him more as kind of the being that can't be related to, that can't really be engaged with at, in a meaningful way. Um, uh, he doesn't really feel like I feel. He doesn't really love like I love. He doesn't really think like I think. His good is my bad. My bad is his good, as C.S. Lewis says. And yeah. then we say, we worship, we know not what, because he's just so other than. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I don't want to downplay, obviously, his other than-ness, his holiness, because he is other than. He is greater and more powerful and beyond our full comprehension. But at the same time, I see throughout every page of Scripture a God who incarnates, who steps into our world, who walks with us, who feels with us, who weeps, who you know interacts and responds. And it seems to me that's that's what you're getting to here in this book is how do you hold to these traditional views of who God is as we've explained it, though they may be beyond full comprehension, but still truly see him as a, a person who we have a daily relationship with. Well, I, I think so. And see, I, I don't think the Calvinists can do it. I really don't. Because, again, the quote you just gave, the ones I give in the book about, you know, well, it, it, anything doesn't mean anything. And then they kind of move on. What it seems to mean something. And then, the, again, on the other side of the name it and claim it, it seems to me they don't allow God to determine anything. That he just determined to give it all over up to us. And clearly you find both. And like I said, I have a chapter in the, I, I do a chapter on where choice is the issue. I do chapter where these passages are just determinism, nothing else, no human affected it at all. But then the interesting ones are the ones which you find both. For example, in Genesis two and three, go to that and what you find, even before you get to the sin, you find God determined certain things. He determined to be a garden. He would put a man in it. He would give a, you know, make a woman for him, etc. He determined there would be animals. He determined that he could grow crops. So determinism is there. Then he said to Adam, name all the animals. And by every appearance, Adam made the choice of what every animal would be named. And I think he did that by observing the essence of the animal but however he did it he did make a free choice to name so there and then of course you have the sin so god said here's the tree don't eat of it that was determined they didn't get a mm -hmm. vote they did get a vote on whether they would eat of it or not there's mm -hmm. an interesting passage in in uh, uh genesis chapter 20 
verse 1 and following, and it's Abimelech and Abraham and Sarah. So Abraham and Sarah, Abraham's done it for the second time. No, she's not my wife. She's my sister. Well, Abimelech, he took her because she wasn't married and put her in his harem. Now, he did not have relations with her, but when you put someone in a harem, you know, it's not because you just want to be their friend. So there were yeah. some ill motive. So anyway, he had a dream. And God said, you took a married wife, woman and you're a dead man. And Abimelech, you know, he responds, he says, wait a minute, I haven't touched her. He said, you know, my integrity is intact. And God said, yeah, I know your integrity is intact, but he had done something wrong in taking her in the harem. And so he said this to him. He's, and, and God said, I have protected you from touching her. Now, maybe he protected him through influence, but I'm going to just say he did it through determinism. He worked so determinatively that Abimelech could not touch her, okay? But Abimelech had made a choice to put her in the harem. That was free. God stopped him from touching her. But then here's what happens after that. And I'm assuming that's determinism. I don't know it. I don't think you can get it from the passage. I'm just going to let right. it lie as that, that one thing. But then, then God says, you give her back. Abraham will pray for you and you will live. So there were two conditions and one outcome. You give her back, Abraham prays, and because Abraham prayed, because you gave her back, you will live. So you mm -hmm. have this interaction of, of people making choices that seem like, I mean, unless you're schooled in some esoteric philosophy, they're making choices. There are consequences yep. to them. God's involved, and I actually think those kinds of circumstances, because God has an objective will, which is the scripture, but the subjective will is what he's leading you to do today and me to do, and that may be different where we live and where our children go to school, whatever, and those are consonant with the scripture, but they are unique, you know, and, and matter of fact, most of our prayers are about our subjective. What's going on? Does God want me to do this, do this? And if it's not real that he's working in those, then we should quit telling people, let's pray, if he's doing everything that he wants to do. And I think sometimes we're engaged in these things. God may have two things that are determined, and three are being decided by choice, just like you find in the Scripture. And you find this with Nebuchadnezzar and so forth. Yeah, David and and Solomon. It, yeah. It, it seems to me that, that sometimes people assume that because we believe in a libertarian freedom of the will that has been given to us by God, in other words, we didn't go out and create our own libertarian free will here. This is something that was God's design for us to have, um, that, that somehow that means God doesn't determine anything yeah. or that God doesn't have a free will of his own um, or that as Jonathan Pritchett puts it, you know, that free will is some kind of a superpower that thwarts the, the promises and plans of God. And none of those things are true um, and, and I remember debating with uh, Dr. Pritchett and I were on one side of the debate against two kind of very high Calvinists um, there in Houston. And they used the story of Abimelech as their proof text to show, see, this is God stopping uh, human will. That, that somehow proves determinism. And we're just looking back, and that's when Pritchett, you know, made his famous comment, <laughs> free will is not a superpower. You know, just because, you know, Abimelech wanted to sleep with Sarah doesn't mean that we believe that God can't step in and stop right. Abimelech from sleeping with Sarah. God can stop our free will action, just like Jonah can choose to run to Nineveh, and God can step in and stop him if he wants to. Um, we, we, we do believe God determines things, and yeah. we don't believe that human free will thwarts the sovereign purposes and plans of God. Yeah, that, that's a total misunderstanding, uh, maybe a misrepresentation by some, but I'm not going to deal with motive. But it's a total misunderstanding of libertarian free will. Libertarian free will, in its essence, says that in some circumstances, we can act or refrain. It does not require it in all circumstances. That's right. one thing. The second thing is the range of options are changing all the time and the range of options for you and for me are different 
the range of options for me at my age today are different than they were when I was 20. So your range of options is always changing. I, I used to give the example, Donald Trump and I have, uh, this is before the presidency and everything, we both have free will. Donald Trump can buy a million dollar house. I can't. It's not within the range of my options. So the range of options changes. Uh, it does not have to be in every circumstance. And when someone, when God overrides, which he can because he gave it. So it's a force like any other force, but it's under his jurisdiction. But when he overrides it, it does not eliminate free will. What it means is that you're not responsible for that one particular decision that he overrode. And Nebuchadnezzar is a great example of this. But we can even do it this way. <clears throat> if you speed and you're drinking and the police pull you over, you made a free will choice to speed and to drink. They're going to haul you off to jail. You did not make a free will choice to do that. You did not want to go to jail. That was determined by them. But you didn't lose your free will. You just lost it in that one thing. When you get in the jail, you still have your free will to do yeah. things, but your range of options has changed. That's the proper understanding of libertarian free will. Yeah, yeah. Well, well said. Um, there's other things that uh, Calvinists often say. I see this from you know famous as well as infamous <laughs> Calvinists uh, along the way. The kinds of statement like we see here uh, from uh, Pensive Tulip. Uh, this is a five-point gnat, somebody who's obviously very uh, gung-ho about her Calvinism because she's even named her Twitter uh, feed after it and everything else. And so she says, no matter what theology one embraces, when agonos, agonos, agonizing excuse me, over a loss of child salvation, everyone prays like a Calvinist. And I've heard others say similar things. I, I know that J.I. Packer uh, in his book uh, says something very similar. Says, uh, what we do every time we pray is to confess our impotence and God's sovereignty. And this is in the context of him defining God's sovereignty the way the Calvinists do as determinism. God controls even our choices, but yet we're held responsible for them. And so you see this uh, across the board. I see it uh, almost at least once a month or so that everyone prays like a Calvinist is, is often the way that it's put. H how do you respond to that? Well, uh, this whole book is about how I don't pray like a Calvinist. <laughs> because I recognize some things are determined, but I also recognize that God has so constituted the universe and our relationship with him that he has made some things conditional. Not just salvation, but many, many things. And I go into even the subject of sending your kid to a school and praying about that. So that's number one. I mean, the whole book's I don't pray like a Calvinist. Number two, regarding a child who, who dies, uh, their salvation. See, I base this on God has shown us that people are saved. Now, I'm not I'm not undermining at all the preaching of the gospel and people are saved by the gospel. I'm saying in what God did on the cross, he provisioned for the Old Testament saints. They did not believe in Jesus like we do. There's only one name given unto heaven, which whereby men may be saved. But they did not believe in Jesus because they didn't know about Jesus. But in the cross, the cross is what I would say is ontologically necessary, meaning essential to the salvation of any person, Old Testament, New Testament, child, whoever it is. And whatever provision God makes, let's say for children, I believe before they come to the time when that child morally understands and can make this kind of decision, which can be different ages for different children based on a lot of different things, that God has provisioned based on the cross that they go to heaven. The Calvinists have the view, they have a few views. One of them is they have, they're in the covenant with the family, so that takes care of them. One is that only the elect children go to heaven, the non-elect don't, they don't know which one they are, so those can't give any hope to uh, someone, and I sure don't want to pray like them. And then the other is, if they've been baptized or christened, then they can go to heaven. So, And there may be some other views, but they have some mixtures, but not all of them are willing to hold to 
the elect, non-elect of children. We all agree, Calvinists and non-Calvinists, God saved people in the Old Testament by faith in God, but the content of that faith changed as we got more revelation. So now it has to be specifically mm -hmm. in Jesus Christ. So I, I would pray if, if I lost a child thanking God that he had provisioned for my child in the cross, just like he has uh, with others and, you know, Old Testament and so forth that didn't know Christ. So I wouldn't pray like a Calvinist in that situation at all. Yeah. Well, I even, I even put uh, in a response to that tweet, I wrote, Lord, please go back to before the foundation of the world and unconditionally choose my child for salvation instead of reprobation. Amen. And then I put, yeah. you know, no one prays like a consistent Calvinist because that's what a consistent Calvinist would have to pray. They would have to say, Lord, elect my child, you know, go, right. go back before the foundation of the world and, you know, unconditionally choose my child for salvation. That would be the consistent prayer of a Calvinist. Whereas a consistent prayer for a provisionist, um, a non-Calvinist would be what, Pastor? I mean, what, what would be a consistent prayer if you have a lost child who's still living Okay. Um, and you want them to be saved. Uh, I know there's a lot of, of talk, and I, and I don't engage in this because I, I don't like to pull in people's own situation, but John Piper has two boys, and, and one seems to be following the Lord, and one seems to be very uh, agnostic or atheistic in his, his response. And that, that can happen to any one of us at any time, where because children do have free will after all. And so that, that I don't like pulling in people's p private pain into theological discussions when at all possible, but I see a lot of non-Calvinists kind of jumping on that. And, and I don't want to do that with Piper, but I know that Piper is quoted as talking about, you know, if God has, you know, chosen one of my children for damnation, that I'm going to have to submit to his will. And, and that's back when they were younger boys, when he, when he wrote that. Um, and, and you've got situations like this where real Calvinists have to deal with this real situation of wondering, has my child been chosen or not? Is my child elect or not? And, and having to pray you know, what do they pray for them? And then, and then, okay, now switch over to our side. We have children. I have four kids. I want to pray for their salvation. Um, uh, and, and I don't want to see them come to know the Lord. How do I pray consistently as a non-Calvinist for the salvation of my own child? Well, I, again, you know, and you know this as, as, as well as anybody, but we and Calvinists have a very different view of salvation, but we have a di bit different view of God. Now, I'm not talking about re her heretical, but our view of who God is and what he's like is quite different. So I take the declarative statements of God that he so loved humanity that he's not willing that any would perish. He gets no you know, joy in the death of the wicked. So for my children, uh, we prayed God would save them. And we tried to live a life that gave them a, an object lesson. And we tried to do things that would influence them in that way. And we had other people praying for them. We didn't let them go certain places and on and on. So we were doing everything following the scripture so to influence them. Now, their testimonies are that those things did influence them and that they saw Christ lived in the home and so forth. And, and so that's what I think that God has so constituted the world that not, not only uh, prayer, but other things have a very, can have a real influence, make a difference in a person's salvation. And let me just, explain and this is in the uh, the book does god love all or some i have a chapter that says that these events and and it would apply to this prayer here uh, us praying that they are constitutionally and organically and substantially related to salvation so uh, just to unpack that just for a second without going into what the book does what i mean by that is we have to come to grips with, so we sh somebody gives their testimony at church, or maybe uh, someone listening is thinking their testimony is that their grandmother, they saw them praying, and that really influenced them to love God. Or, you know, they were raised to know the scripture. 
So they're telling all of these experiences that didn't save them, but they played a part. Right. So I think that these are constitutionally related by God in his salvational work. And I would just say what I mean by a salvational plan, if you'll take an umbrella, everything under that umbrella is grace. And that's his salvational plan, including man having libertarian freedom and being able to make a decision. But God can use a grandmother praying, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that means they're related. But the organic part of it is it speaks of the complex relationship. So I don't see a testimony, uh, my testimony before my children, our prayers for them, us going to a certain church. I don't see them here and here. I see them organically related to what God is doing in salvation so that they're meaningful. They really do have an impact on them. And I use a flower. If you look at a flower, you know, it has petals, it has the leaves, it has the stem, it has several parts to it, and we call it a flower. But the parts are organically related. Some of them are insubstantial, meaning if they're gone, it's still a flower. So you can pick a leaf and it'll live. But if you take the roots away, that's substantially related and the flower will die. So some of these things in the salvation process of God working in our life, people really can impact us for the kingdom, uh, witnessing to us and so forth. And, and some of those things are substantially related, meaning if they didn't happen, the outcome would be different. That person may not got saved at that time. That wouldn't be a part of their testimony. I, I can't tell you what all would be, but it would be different. In Calvinism, because of unconditional election, when you strip away all the gloss of Calvinism, whether it's a grandmother praying, whatever somebody shares in their testimony about all these things that contributed, they're insubstantially related, meaning you could strip them all away and unconditional election stands. Because if you say, well, no, if that wouldn't have happened, that person wouldn't have got saved. You've now made unconditional election conditional. And I know what you're thinking and others, well, it's a part of the process. That's not what we're talking about. It's a part of a determined process so that you saw your grandmother praying and it influenced you is really nothing. It was just part of the process. I'm talking about you saw it and it really affected you. And if it, if she wouldn't have been doing that, you wouldn't have had that experience the outcome would have been different. I'm not saying you wouldn't have got saved. I'm not saying, I'm just saying the outcome would be different. So I think prayer, witnessing, people sharing the gospel, our testimony, uh, uh, Titus chapter two, verse 11 says, you know, and by their testimony, the, these slaves, you adorn the doctrine of God. And that word adorn means to make Christ desirable appealing yeah and that's what i'm talking about we do things that have a substantial relationship where calvinism does not have that once you can peel back all the gloss of yeah oh, yeah the process matters but the process could be gone and unconditional elections going to stay yeah and the, and the way a calvinist oftentimes pushes back on us is, is to say well god ordains the ends as well as the means um, and they'll say that the means are necessary. So the prayer of the righteous man availeth much. Well, those are the means that God uses to bring about the salvation, just like it, on the opposite side, the hardening side, you know, the use of parabolic language and the hardening, blinding. And we always ask, you know, why would God harden or blind somebody who was born total corpse like dead, like the T of your system teaches? And, we, and, and they'll say, well, God uses means. Um, and, and this is where I, I just push back and I say, well, the means are superfluous. They don't mean anything yeah. because blinding and hardening somebody who's already born completely, totally blinded and hardened, hardened spiritually speaking, in, 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 a, in a way that they can't understand and respond positively, why put a blindfold on a corpse? The means don't mean anything. In other words, if you get rid of the means, the same result ensues. Um, and the same thing with the prayer for salvation. You said, well, God uses means. Well, okay, let's take away the prayer. Does the unconditionally elected person still get saved? 
Yes, on Calvinism, it does. The, the prayers are superfluous. And that's, what, that's why I keep saying means mean something on provisionism, because the means of hardening actually mean something. The means of prayer actually mean something. They have an effect. They actually do something. Well, um, and, and that's important for us, I think, to point out, don't you? I, I do. I think it's so important because when, if you just read the Scripture, <clears throat> like a number of passages that I give, you know, Joshua, choose you this day whom you serve. But if you read that whole chapter, I mean, they were, they were dealing, uh, worshiping foreign gods across the river. So he, he said, you can worship them, you can worship the gods of your father, or you can choose to follow Jehovah. And Jehovah had done all these things for them. Now choose. So it wasn't just a choose choice between A and B, it was a choice between A, B, C. So a lot of right. these get very, what I would call complex. And so it's not just a means. When you read the scripture in its simple form, you're just saying, this really looks like he gave them a choice. They had three options and they were to choose one and they did. Yep. And they could have chosen any of them as had already been seen because they were doing it and their fathers did it. So I think when they say, well, he ordains the means, I hope everybody understands. Yeah, everything's predetermined. So your grandmother praying for you, the only reason she did that it wasn't out of love. It wasn't out of concern. She did it because God predetermined for her to be praying at that second and you to see it. It, it becomes kind of a theatrics. Well, and, well, they they could say it was out of love, but it would be love that God predetermined. It's a, obviously, it's a, it's a God <laughs> it's a predetermined love. Love, right. See? right, right. But it's not the love we're thinking about, and we have to make those clarifications. In Mark chapter nine, <clears throat> with the rich young ruler, you know, he asks a serious question. You know, what what do I have to do to be saved? It's the same question the Philippian jailer asked. What must I do to be saved? Jesus answered it longer, but it's the same basic thing. But the interesting thing in the Mark parallel uh, passage of that is, and it says, and Jesus loved him. And it's the word agape. And it looks like Jesus really loved him. And it looks like Jesus really wanted him to be saved. And it looks like Jesus told him this so he could be saved. And when he went away, Jesus was not happy about it. Now, they say, I say if there's an elect and a non-elect, <clears throat> then apparently he was a non-elect, but yet Jesus had a salvational love for him. And they say, well, as a man, he didn't know. Here's the problem with that. Jesus said he only did the will of the Father. He only spoke the words of the Father. So whether Jesus knew as a man, God the Father knew, and he was speaking words that he salvationally loved him, but he actually, well, it was all theatrics because he hadn't elected him. So I think these things yeah. have to have meaningful understanding as you read them. Absolutely, well said. Um, I, I think that as people engage with this kind of discussion, especially when it comes to uh, are relating to God, I think it's really important because it, it helps us to know that when we pray, things happen. You know, when we pray, it affects not only ourselves, but it affects the people around us. And that's the one of the reasons that we need to pray. We need to be a part of, of, of you know, engaging with what the world is happening around us because it's not just faded. It's not just, you know, set in stone in the way that we can't affect it, but that the way God created this universe, as wow. mysterious as it may be, seems to be the kind of universe where we have true and meaningful impact mm -hmm. in the way things end up. And it seems to me your your book is really taking that on by, by uh, explaining why uh, prayer is important and that we should be engaging in prayer. And so I, I appreciate uh, you engaging that, that subject for us. Uh, taking it deeper, going to the, the, the biblical source, the, the, the source of our authority, which is the scripture, and helping us to understand how that, that looks for a theologian and, and someone who's trying to be consistent, obviously, logically as well, uh, understanding that God's given us the ability to reason to think through these things. And so thank you, uh, Pastor Ronnie, for writing this book and for taking the time to unpack it with us. Uh, I've put a link in the show notes to the link on Amazon where you can find the book for those that would like to download it. Several in the side comments have already said they just ordered it. So I appreciate those who are, are jumping on to, to do that. Um, and, and Pastor Ronnie, uh, I appreciate your work in your ministry as well. 
Thank you very much. Same with you. As always now, go share Christ and show love. God bless. Thank you.